With the new Chevy Silverado, you might be driving in this. But with the Silverado's redesigned interior and large infotainment screens, it'll feel more like this. Introducing the new 2022 Chevy Silverado. Find new upgrades. Find new roads. Chevrolet. Whether it's Kroger Simple Truth Turkey or Mac and Cheese with Murray's English Cheddar or pie made with fresh Cosmic Crisp apples, there are many dishes we look forward to sharing during the holidays. And Kroger has all the fresh ingredients you need to turn today's holidays into tomorrow's memories. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Get more ways to save at the Buy 5 or More Save $1 each sale. Just buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with card. Kroger, fresh for everyone. The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is John Silver, lead recruiter of the Dark Order, and you are listening to All Things Elite. Welcome everyone to one the 176th episode of Social Suplexes Podcast about AEW with the proclivity for positivity. Welcome to All Things Elite. I am your host, Floyd Johnson, and joining me today, I have a special guest. I call him the Finn Possible Dream. He's always Finn and Chill. It's Mr. David Finishell. How you doing, Dave? I'm just here so I don't get fined. He's just here so he doesn't get fined. Now, uh, Dave and me became friends through Mr. Rich Lotta. We met at All Out 2020 or 20. It was in 2019, right? Or 2020, uh, 2019. It was the first. It was the first All Out. I, when, yeah. when when I went, it was out in Chicago. Yeah, first first All Out. So that had to be 2019 already. Huh? 2019. He met my lovely brother, and I blame Dave because the first game. First football game we ever watched together, my Florida State Seminoles lost, so it was all Dave's fault. I mean, to be fair, they were a steaming pile of hot garbage back then. They you know, were, not the respectable football team that you see before you today. They were terrible. They were terrible, admittedly, but we only lost because of you. Now, um, yeah. Um, I wish I had that kind of power. I mean, that kind of absolute power would be pretty neat. Dude, I'm a sports fan, so literally, I am one of those people. I took my friend... Stephanie, we went to Tallahassee. I had never seen Florida State lose at home. They lost on a 54-yard field goal on a, against a kicker who had never made a field goal over 50 yards. Yeah, so clearly you're the jinx, not me. So I was in the, you know, I was in the building and I had never seen them lose. So I'd been there like five or six times, and they were there. You know what? Never going to a game with her again, ever. Yeah, yeah. You should have like left her on the side of the road <laughs> on the way home. Do you know if we weren't in Tallahassee trying to get back to Oklahoma? Definitely would have. Like right? Uh, yes, because that is right. I mean, completely justified. It would have been the only logical explanation yes. is to leave her there. Yes, today I'm going to actually be talking about, on a way, I might not be a good fan. I've always considered myself a great fan, but I might not be a good fan. Uh, So, we want you to all make sure you are downloading this fine show on Google or Apple Podcasts. Please leave a rating and review, and if you are so inclined, you can follow us at AT Elite Pod. That's the show. At Social Suplex, they they are responsible for this show. At Austin Sumowitz, that's S. Z U M O W I C Z at Floyd Johnson Jr. on Twitter. And also, you can follow Mr. Finishell at Finishell Dave. That's F E N I C H E L D A V E. That's it. And you'll see David Finishell, and he is the not the faceless profile. So he's probably saying something really sexist on your replies. Um, 
It's a giant mystery. You'll have to follow me to find out. <laughs> You're going to have to follow him to find out. But again, thanks, Dave, for jumping on here. He's coming. This is finally Dave has come back to podcasting. How, how long has it been since you've done your last podcast? Gosh, it's probably been about three years. You know, I used to I used to podcast every week, you know, and uh, it's it's fun. I miss doing it. But, you know, you get busy with life and having kids and big, big changes and all, all sorts of stuff. And you kind of lose track of yourself. So I am super excited to be here. And I can't thank you enough for having me on. Yeah, Dave is affectionately known as Rich Lada's wrestling soulmate. They agree on everything. I hope he dies in a forest fire. <laughs> All right. The big news of the week is FTR had. Okay. This is where I go to not being the greatest fan ever. I think FTR had an amazing week. To some, outside looking in, wins and losses mattering, blah, blah, blah. FTR had a really shitty week. <laughs> so I'm leaning towards a good week. Dave, which one do you leave it to? I mean, it's an amazing week. They had two. Absolutely classic matches this week. Uh, you know, I mean, they listen, it's fake wrestling. Wins and losses only matter for storyline purposes, not in the eyes of how well did you perform this week. And the reality is they had two of like arguably the five best matches this year uh, within within the span of a week. Which I don't, I don't see how it gets all that much better than that. Yeah, with two completely different teams. You can completely different teams, completely different styles, completely different circumstances, but the same result. Amazing yes. matches. So I'm not. I was at. Uh, I was at AW Dynamite in Austin. Not going to super go into that one, but I do want to talk about the match. FTR versus the Claim. FTR finally gets their title shot against the Acclaimed for the AEW Tag Team Titles. Um, uh, I thought the match was a banger. Uh, but I'm going to let Dave, because he is my guest, uh, talk about what you thought of the match, sir. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I knew going in that FTR was going to lose, right? And, you know, I, I understand. The Acclaimed is so popular right now. They're the number one merch seller. It's pretty hard to take the titles off them. So, you know, going in, I was trying to, like, find a reason not to like this match. And it was pretty hard to get there, you know? It just built and built and built and built and built. I thought the the false finishes were fantastic. I thought the crowd reaction was fantastic. I thought that the clean finish was exactly the right way to do it. You know, it wasn't so definitive where, you know, FTR came off looking like chumps, but it was creative and unique, and uh, it was a big win for the acclaimed. I mean, it was the kind of win where you sit there and you say, okay, they're, they're taking them very seriously in their tag run, as opposed to just a popular comedy act that just happens to have the tag belts because they're popular. So I thought it was a great match. You know, uh, I really, I really loved everything about it. No complaints, no qualms, uh, no qualms whatsoever. First thing, I want to give a shout out tomorrow to the crowd, Cedar Park. They were on fire. Uh, all night, just loud into everything. Uh, it was amazing. And I just did think about one more thing I wanted to talk about from the show before we uh, get into our uh, final battle review. But that being said, uh, they were hot for everything, but they were specifically hot for this match. It went to the commercial. Everybody in my section was standing up. Everybody was just excited. And this something happened in this match that doesn't happen to me. I always tell you I am an emotional wrestling fan, right? As much as I know, as I talk about this on a podcast, and I'm friends with some of the smartest wrestling minds in in the game, and you know, and they generally tell me how things are going to work out before. With the excitement and the energy of the crowd, I just got completely caught up in this match. Uh, it started off slow and built, and it built perfectly. And there were so many great false finishes. So I'll say this. About the last 10 minutes of the match, I actually sent this message. So for about 10 minutes last night during the match, I was a kid again. Completely caught up in the match, living and dying on every pinfall attempt. Not thinking about how it ended, just in the moment. I can't say that has happened to me uh, a ton as an adult, but it did last night because I sent this on Thursday. Just had to tell you. And that's how, exactly how I felt in that moment. I just really loved that match. And they, to me, it, it brought the AEW tag division in its whole upper level, right? Because for a while, it was, you had the Lucha Bros, right? 
You you had the Lucha Bros, you had the Young Bucks, you kind of had FTR. They were above everybody else, right? I feel like over the last few months, they have a, a elevated a claim to another level. They have elevated Swerve in our glory to another level, which, you know, they may or might not be together, you know, long term, which it seems like they're not going to be together long term. But it seems like the whole division is elevated. And now it's in safe hands with the acclaim as they go on forward with their uh, super popular team. And I know, like I said, I know I'm a bad fan because I've never really cared, you know, if FTR wins. And it's, it's I know that the people lie. I mean, they was like, oh, you, well, you know, you're FTR Express. You, you got all the pictures of FTR. But I've always thought about wrestling in a different way, as in, you know, I'm going to see my favorite people wrestle. And the fact that I get to see them wrestle, that's what makes me happy. And they wrestle at such a high level. When they need to make a team look good, they do it perfectly. When they do need to win, they do that perfectly too. So I just love just seeing them perform. And they had a great match. And even to top it all off, top it all off after the claim, get the win on a roll up. That's very old school wrestling. Title matches very well, never used to end on a finisher. So this was really cool that, uh, the, uh, you know, Max Caster rolled up, uh, uh, cash and got the pin. So after the match, uh, we get, uh, the gun club. They said they got a special gift from someone, dim boys, and they're a dog collar match. They challenged, uh, Briscoe's FTR dog collar match at, uh, Ringo Arnold final battle. We'll talk about that shortly. But then after the match, they're going around the ring, right? And uh, first of all, Dax is just going around hug. I get up to the front. Dax looks at me. Uh, Dax looks at me. He smiles real big and comes and gives me a hug. He's like, I'm glad you made it. And then Cash is kind of shaking hands. He says hi to this kid. He's doing his thing, right? And he kind of gets right in front of me, and he's literally staring me in the eye before he's like, oh, Floyd, what's up? And then he gives me a big hug. So it was a pretty, it was a, uh, just a pretty cool moment. They just like, when your favorites are genuine, genuinely happy to see you, and you can tell that, that, that is uh, very cool. So uh, that's how that show ended. But there is one more thing I wanted to talk about. I almost forgot. I didn't even put it in the show notes. But as I was talking about Austin and being hot, do talk about that Ricky Starks promo. Oh, man, it was amazing. You know, the thing is with Ricky Starks, every time he gets a microphone in his hand, he absolutely knocks it out of the park. It's the reason that people will care about him if they care about him. You know, that promo was absolute fire. He was every bit the match for MJF. And it was really a star making promo. I mean, you know, I went from thinking like this match was pretty lukewarm to with with a foregone conclusion to you know still thinking it's a foregone conclusion that MJF is going to win but that match suddenly feels like a big deal and Ricky Stark suddenly feels like a big deal like everything about that was absolutely perfect you know you could tell the passion you could tell the fire you could tell that he knew this was his chance to really connect with the audience and to to elevate himself to a level that he hadn't previously been been before and i think he absolutely did that do you agree Absolutely. Austin was living and dying on every word. It was just such a, a monumental. He completely tore down MJF's character. But he, you know, and he completely, because way that MJF cuts promos, if you don't cut back just as hard, you look, you looked at like you're less than. And he cut back just as hard. And it was just amazing from what I understand. A few things, few people uh, have posted that that wasn't like his original promo. It was like he just got out there and felt it. And you could kind of feel it. Uh, he just went, you know, into that zone and just cut the promo. And it's just like literally a star was made that night. It was like, you know, Ricky was always a star, but a star was made. And it was like I almost took a fit's. When MJF said he was uh, a dollar store rock and he said he was going to call him the pebble. Now, I, I, I love the rock. I love the rock. Now, few people on this earth love the rock more than me. But whenever I go watch his promos through 2022 eyes, you know what I realized about a lot about his promos? He didn't say a lot. 
He, he, yeah, I mean, he, he say you smell like old pennies and Dr. Pepper or he put two random fucking things that probably make no sense together and he would make you laugh and I would laugh. I'm actually laughing now. But when you think about the context of his promo, he literally just kind of made fun of the guy and a lot of the insults didn't make sense. Where you, Rick, you know, I, oh, go ahead. You, you know, I, I completely agree with you. You know, the thing is, though, but that kind of speaks to a bigger picture about promos in that. You know, it's not necessarily the the words you say or the words you choose or the or the topic. It's it's how you make people feel, right? And The Rock, regardless of what he said, had so much charisma and the way he delivered things and the and the the charisma that he exhibited just made people feel a certain way. And you know, not not that I really compare the two, but that's what I took from um, the Ricky Starks promo on on Dynamite was that. You know, there's just something about the way he talks yeah. that makes you feel a certain way, and it makes you feel really good. And and, and it's and also I think added that, that he has substance. He said something. You know what I mean? Just wasn't random insults. He dissected who MJF was as a person. I I do. It was uh, it was uh, unbelievable. And you know, I think it got to a point where like. You know, prior prior to this promo, I was really feeling like, you know, he was going to lose and he was just going to fall back in line and and just kind of be doing what he's been doing. Right. But I think that he elevated himself to a point where even though he's going to obviously lose to MJF, um, I'm interested to see what he does next. I feel like he's got to end up in a big program. I don't know what that looks like, but. Uh, you know, there, there's got to be a big program that involves him that's very close to the top of the card after MJF is is, is through with him. Unfortunately, last year, was that winter? Yeah, it was Winter is Coming, because I actually that was Crystal's first show. They went to a one-hour draw, right? But man, if that hadn't happened, that's what I'd be calling for in this match. One-hour draw. <laughs> oh, you mean between... Uh... Between Hangman and uh, and Danielson? Yeah, it was at the this exact same show, so you can't go back and do it at this exact same show again. Right. Yeah, I I, I feel like that. You know, this is this is a definitive win for MJF. Yeah. Uh, but you know, hey, you, you never know, right? I'm I'm super interested in that match, and I know we're going to talk about that more later. But yeah, uh, you know, could could not be more excited. But yes, I just want to send a shout out to Ricky Starks. We talk about five star matches. Very rarely do we talk about five star promos, and I definitely thought that promo was a five and a half. I was like, dude, it was it was beyond perfect. It was be about halfway through. It was perfect, and then he just took it to a next to a next level. He built excitement for this match. This dude is really really good at his job. So. Yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Those are the two things we're really covering from Dynamite because we got a yeah because we got a full ROH final battle uh, review that's coming. So here we go. Let's get started with our final battle review. Another show that I just happened to be at was ROH final battle Saturday. Uh, Saturday uh, live from Arlington, Texas, from the campus of UTA. Um, got a funny story. I think I told you this one, Dave, right? Oh, yeah, I told you because you stepped on my line, I remember. Uh, <laughs> so I went with my friend Rusty and Ryan. We're standing outside. We're sitting there, uh, on, uh, sitting there on the bench. I'm looking down at my phone. Ryan's looking down at his phone. Rusty's looking around. And he's like, man, that guy over there, he sure is trying his hardest to be Swerve Strickland. And I okay, I was like, that's weird. And I'm look, I'm like, I, I'd never seen a Swerve Strickland cosplay, so I'm like, this has intrigued me. So I looked over and I look at him, and I was like, as you most might want to guess, I was like, yeah, because that is Swerve Strickland. He's like, no, it's not. I was like, dude, that's Swerve Strickland. First of all, I was like, because I, I only could see his walk. I was like, no one walks like Swerve Strickland. That's Swerve Strickland. And then he, then he, then Swerve did the thing. I guess someone like yelled, and he looked to the left, and I saw his face, and I'm like. That's Swerve Strickland. And, like, he really couldn't believe it. I'm like, so you can't believe that the guy that looks t and looks and walks like Swerve Strickland is Swerve Strickland. So it was just a very funny moment because he was, like, ready to go in on this guy doing a Swerve Strickland cosplay. But it, it was Swerve Strickland. Yeah, so I was telling Dave this line, and I got, like, halfway through the story. And he's like, oh, it was Swerve Strickland, wasn't it? Definitely. I can't help it. I jumped the gun, you know. Yeah, he's a wrestling fan. You know, I'm a, we I'm can't wait for the story I'm, I'm to play out. I'm a premature joke. 
I'm a premature joker in her. It's uh, it's one of my natural gifts in life. I just can't help myself. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah, I just thought it was. I I laughed a good couple minutes because it was like, dude, yeah, that's that's who that is. Um, so we get in the show. Uh, there was a zero hour. Dave, did you watch Zero Hour at all? I did not watch Zero Hour. I was glued to England versus France in the World Cup. So uh, I uh, that that match that 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 uh, that game literally ended at like. 359 my time so dave chose to waste his time so let's go talk about what i saw at zero when the first match we had mascara dorada who is um grand metalik from the wwe and so i looked up the name and i was like man that's a really creative name mascara dorada right i was like man that's a creative name i wonder how i came up to him. you bring up Wiki- wikipedia now i don't know if it's true but that's they said it's his real name. I was like, dude, you got a really cool real name in my head. You know what I mean? So, no, uh, he wrestled against Jeff Cobb. A solid match. Jeff Cobb took him on a tour of the island and got to the three. Throw, representing the United Empire. So, first couple matches, the person sitting next to me it, it, that was closest to the uh, like aisle wasn't there so i got to stand over so if you look in the first couple matches when the entrance come out you'll see my big beautiful brown face but yes so uh cobb beating mascara this dorada was a pretty good match the uh, next match was uh mr angelo parker and uh daddy magic uh, Man- uh matt menard and then uh cool hand and inch parker beat the shadow shinobi shadow squad which is cheeseburger and Eli Eason, I got to tell you about Cheeseburger. Wherever he goes, he's over. Like, everywhere he goes, this man is over. And people are cheering for him. Cheeseburger, Cheeseburger. Uh, relatively exciting match, but basically uh, uh, basically 2.0 won the match. Then we had Willow Nightingale, who is, oh my God, super over. Super over. Good old Will and Nightingale. I actually got to meet her before the show on Dynamite. She's so pleasant. Just so amazing. And, uh, yeah, she wrestled against Trisha Dora. They had a good match. Willow Willow won with her Dr. Bomb. And then we had Top Flight versus uh, The Kingdom. Hey, on my notes, it says Top Flight beat The Top Flight. So, you know, <laughs> no, I mean, Top Flight beat The Kingdom in what you would have to call an upset. The kingdom, to for lack of a better term, ROH royalty. They have been there forever. So uh, Top Flight gets a big win over uh, the kingdom, just straight up, just a win. Um, uh, Maria was uh, ejected from ringside during the match that opened up the chance for Dante and Darius to get the win. So that was kind of like your first upset of the night. But that was Zero Hour. Now we're getting into the main show, which Dave has seen in its entirety. And we start with kind of a controversial, funny match. Uh, we start with Mr. Recently Signed, AEW, uh, first big contract, AR Fox, tagging with um, All Heart, Blake Christian. <laughs> and they were wrestling against Drillistico, which is the younger brother of his tag team partner, Roosh. So in, in a match... Um, uh, they, I mean, this is your, st- this is your standard AEW first match. Lots of flying, lots of excitement. You know, everyone's like, oh, uh, uh, the, what is it? What is the group called? I honestly have no idea. Dude, my brain is broken. Yeah, I'm drawing total blank. I know yes. exactly what you're talking about. Yo, uh, Ingnabal- so we- oh, the Ingobernals. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 I can't pronounce anything. I'm I'm basically like a child. Yes. So, yes. Them uh, with uh, Preston. T- Preston, you like, oh, they're just going to get the win. Uh, so there's this moment where I don't even remember who's pinning who. Uh, but Drillistico is getting pinned by, I believe, A.R. Fox. Yep. And the referee called, counts to three. Uh, <laughs> and you could tell that's not how that match was supposed to end. And the referee counted to three. I personally have watched it back. I feel like Drillistico kicked out. What do you think? You know, it was borderline, but that's kind of like, this is my problem, right? So, um, 
I, I imagine that the the referees know the finishes prior, right? They're not just in there running blind. So if they know who's supposed to win, how hard is it to cover something like that up? It's not all that hard, especially something like that where it's borderline, you know? Like, it, just the idea that, like, this match could end because the referee counted to three before Jurlistico kicked out in a predetermined fake wrestling match is absolutely mind-blowing to me. And I agree with you. This was a fun match, you know? I mean, there were lots of high spots. It was a little sloppy at times, but, you know, I'm like you. I, I don't mind sloppiness in my wrestling, you know? And uh, it was kind of, like, fun in a, in a car crash kind of way. Uh, but, you know, it is. I can't think about this match without thinking about the absolute stupidity of the ending. And, and how about that post- match nonsense, right? I mean, it looked like Roosh and Jerisco just legitimately cracked them in the head with steel chairs in an attempt to get their heat back. Like it just it just seems so out of place and the kind of thing that happens in like a carnival show, don't you agree? Yeah, uh, yeah, it was crazy cuz they were trying to recover and they were trying to fix it. Like that just didn't get completely screwed up. And you know, of course, everything's timed so uh, everything's time, so you have to, you know, cover for the minutes that you had given up because now the other matches would have to cover. So it was it was awkward. It, it, you know, everybody knew it was awkward. Everybody knew it was broken, but it was hilarious. I don't know. It was a great moment. It was otherwise, hey, this team's, they're going to fly around and this team's just going to pin that other team. It, it made an interesting ending uh, for the night, but yeah. Fun. Yeah, it was. It was it hilarious. Was... It was fun, you know. I mean, who cares that Air Fox now has brain damage from unprotected <laughs> shots uh, to the to the head? I mean, Mick Foley from the the Royal Rumble uh, 2000 was like, "Wow, that's excessive." Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, hey, maybe, hey, you know what? It's okay because he didn't remember that he got hit in the head the next day. No, and I'm sure Air Fox <laughs> doesn't remember those brutal chair shots he took either. Yes, no. Um, so yeah, so in an upset again. Two upsets in a row. A.R. Fox and Blake Christian beat the list going Roosh. I literally thought they were going to run this back match back on Dynamite. I, I honestly, I just expected to see it again on Dynamite. I didn't, shocked that that didn't happen. Well, listen, I'm sure A.R. Fox didn't get cleared. Yes. And in your first title match of the evening, Dallas's own Athena and good Lord, was she Dallas's own? <laughs> it's like she was cheered from the moment that she came in to the moment that she lost. And she was the quote unquote heel, which I've made the argument heels and faces don't really exist. People just cheer who they want to cheer now. And yeah, so her and uh, Mercedes Martinez went out there and had what I thought was my second match, favorite match of the night. They were both just like hard hitting, like laying into each other. And it was just, uh, it was like well executed. Just two really good professional wrestlers putting on a really good professional wrestling match. At one point, if you remember this, uh, Athena tears off the turnbuckle and then throws it in the crowd. My friend Ryan, who was sitting next to me, actually caught said turnbuckle. They took to the turnbuckle away from him after catching, and then they got booed, right? After the show, uh, he called the guy over that took the turnbuckle, said, hey, I caught the turnbuckle. They went and gave the turnbuckle back to him. So he has a ring-used turnbuckle from ROH Final Battle 2022. God, yeah, what a what a cool story, you know, and it's it's funny because I, I, you know, it was very clear to hear the give it back chant on TV. And, you know, we were a little confused and it was almost to the point where they almost like ruined the finish because they're getting right to the finish as the give it back chant was going, you know. But I agree. I, I, really, I really largely echo everything you said about this match. Um, I'm a big fan of Athena. I'm a big fan of Mercedes Martinez. You know, I think that both have been like misused and miscast in the past. And like this match really allowed them to do what they do best, which is physical, hard hitting wrestling, you know? And, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, 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 there was some, you know, question I think going in as to, you know, how this match was going to end, but I think Athena winning was absolutely the right call. I think that her gimmick is, uh, is uh is great you know the idea that she's too physical of a worker right you know and so i feel like that's going to allow her to have plenty of hard-hitting matches under the ring of honor banner and with you know ring of honor kind of shifting gears and moving in a new direction like i i like that they've made her the linchpin of that women's division you know uh 
I don't know what what uh, where where she goes from here. I don't know the you know the level of uh, of competition that's currently signed to Ring of Honor, but I'm uh, I'm interested in watching. I think that she is a perfect fit to uh, to lead that division. Well, speaking of finish, it came when Athena ran uh, Mercedes into the exposed turnbuckle, got on the top, hit the O face. And uh, gets the one, two, three, your new ROH world champion. Athena had won both the NXT and ROH titles, women's titles, in the Dallas area. So that's kind of, that was a kind of cool fact that I found out about the match. Uh, she's like, and it's so funny. I, I, I know you watched it. She's playing like she's, an, you know, like an asshole and, you know, she's doing the heel thing. But everybody's cheering her doing a you deserve it chant. It's just so funny. You can adjust. You can cry. You can wave at the fans. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> call a, the call. girl the girlhood dream has come true. I'm like, yeah, I'm just like, you can call an audible and you're like, they were cheering you. They liked you. And she's like, Yeah, you don't know. And she's trying to do the heel thing. I'm like, dude, it's okay to adjust. You can never be, you can be angry next time. Never break character, Floyd. Never break character. <laughs> I was like, you can be angry next time. But that was a really cool match. And like I said, it was my second match of the favorite match of the night. And honestly, I felt like it was a card full of really good matches. Uh, the next match, it was Swerve in Our Glory featuring uh, the aforementioned Swerve Strickland, who, you know, is trying his hardest to look like Swerve Strickland. And Mr. Keith Lee from Wichita Fall Tall's Texas. Uh, there's an independent uh, wrestling company, I believe, called VIP that's in this vicinity. Keith Lee, Shane Taylor, J.D. Griffey. Uh, Keith Lee and Shane Taylor were both champions of VIP. When uh, Keith Lee actually signed, he dropped a belt to Shane Taylor. So in this match, it's the, uh, Keith Lee and Swerve versus Shane Taylor and J.D. Griffey. J.D. Griffey kind of has an MMA gimmick, you know. It's like, yeah, he's an MMA guy. So I thought this match, my favorite parts of this match is when, when Keith Lee and Shane Taylor were in the ring together. Swerve is so naturally skilled, naturally fluid, naturally smooth. He's almost too that way, so everything looks effortless. His character work is on another level. I think that's what brings, like, makes him different is his character work, and I thought his character work was on another level in this match. So we get to a point in the match where um, Swerve and uh, Keith Lee are doing a double team on J.D. Griffey, and he moves out the way, and Swerve accidentally, clearly accidentally hits, I mean, Keith Lee accidentally hits Swerve. Swerve, in response to Keith Lee abandoning him last time, abandons Keith Lee. But unlike when Swerve got abandoned against the claim, Keith Lee through J.D. Griffey, hits his Big Bang Collider and gets the one, two, three. After the match, Keith Lee, J.D. Griffey, and Shane Taylor all hug, apologize, seem to make up, and Swerve is in the back as this was happening. What did you think of this match? You know, before I get into the match itself, you know, I mean, are you sure that this was the real Swerve Wrestling and not just the imposter you saw in the parking lot on the way in? Dude, no telling. I mean, I'm pretty sure he would love a double to take some of them bumps. You know what I mean? So I don't know. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a tough life. So this was a really interesting match to me. You know, I, it felt very old school in the sense that I feel like tag matches used to build up to like a big one on one confrontation between you know, one, one wrestler on, on each team a lot. Right. And, you know, you could tell that was this, this match, right? Like the entire psychology of the match was to build up to the confrontation between Shane Taylor and, and Keith Lee. And, you know, I was always going to love this match. I'm a big fan of swerve, but like Keith Lee is like arguably my favorite wrestler. You know, I feel like everything he touches turns gold. And, uh, you know, so, so, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed everything about this and I agree with you. The best parts of the match were, you know, those involving, uh, Keith Lee and and Shane Taylor, but you know it was kind of a little bit weird to me that uh, Swerve in Our Glory got the win here, right? Because you know, I mean, when you when you flash back to Full Gear, you know, which we had the pleasure of you know going to together, right? You know, and and Keith Lee walked out on Swerve, and that led to the acclaimed winning, right? You know, and so obviously they wanted to kind of you know shadow that a little bit by having 
you know, swerve, walk out on Keith Lee this time. And, you know, as such, it would have made all the sense in the world to have, you know, Shane Taylor and and company win, you know, as a result of, you know, swerve walking out. There was really no benefit to having Keith Lee actually win that match, you know, and it almost makes Swerve's walkout less effective. Um, so, and, and on top of that, you know, I mean, I think you could have absolutely used this match as a vehicle to get to Keith Lee versus, you know, Shane Taylor one-on-one and gotten a little bit more mileage out of that. So, you know, I mean, I thought the match was really good. It was one of my favorite matches on the card. Um, I did like the psychology behind it, but the ending definitely left something to be desired in my, in my eyes. Completely agree. It has to be. I mean, I know Keith Lee's the walking cheat code, but the only way this absolutely makes sense is with uh, Keith Lee losing. But, you know, it is what it is in this case. They they made a decision. They had the big hug moment after life. I mean, even uh, even kind of Tony kind of said it. He's like, you know, Keith Lee suggested it. So this feels like I don't know if Shane Taylor is going to be long for ROH, but it does, it came off as a very much of a favor. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm going to put you on the show. Shane Taylor's a really good wrestler, very intimidating guy. I thought there was a possibility for him to end up being uh, Strickland's uh, heavy because, you know, I I think Swerve works worked best in Hit Row. I thought that was the best presentation of him, him yeah. with a group in front of him. So that's what I thought we may get there. But I'm not saying that won't happen, but I thought it was going to be play out tonight to the, uh, on Saturday in ROH and it did not. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I think that, you know, it would have made a ton of sense to have those guys with, with Swerve and I'm, I'm with you, you know, Swerve like, you know, I mean, he doesn't wrestle like a cowardly heel, but his persona comes off as kind of like a cowardly heel. Right. You know, and I think that would work great with like, you know, some, some muscle behind him. So, you know, I'm interested to see where they go. Uh, you know, like I obviously, I, like I said, you know, Keith Lee is one of my favorite wrestlers swerve as vastly grown in my eyes. And I'm always paying attention to, to what he does. And, uh, I want to see, you know, where this feud plays out. Right. You know, because the fact that they had it on ring of honor TV, like if they're going to break up, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world. If both swerve and Keith Lee end up wrestling for ring of honor on a regular basis, you know, I think ring of honor definitely could use the help from a roster standpoint. And, uh, I think that, you know, having both of those guys there would benefit everybody. I do definitely think you're going to get people going in and in out of ring of honor and they would be great additions to the show. Uh, and I think Swerve has wrestled at all of the Ring of Honor events this year. I know in at Supercard of Honor, he wrestled and did a meet and greet before. So it looks like he might end up being double duty or featured in both shows. And now we get, then we had the six man match uh, between the champions, Dalton Castle and the boys. Dalton Castle. I love uh, Dalton Castle up into the bell rings. And I'm just going to say his act is like amazing up into the bell rings. And then you had the embassy, the machine, Brian cage, Mr. Get his shit in Mr. I've never seen him have a bad match. Maybe I haven't been wrestling, watching him wrestle long enough, but I've never seen the man have a bad match. I enjoy him with Khan and Toa Leona. And in the end, you know, Sometimes, you know, Goliath just beats the shit out of David, and that's what happened in this case. The embassy uh, defeats Dalton Castle and the boy to become the boys to become your new ROH six man champion. Honestly, didn't think a lot of this match. Thought it was fine. Uh, just like I didn't, honestly just didn't think a lot of it. So, what did you think, sir? It, it served its purpose, you know. Um, I uh, I'm I'm a huge fan of Cage, right? So uh, you know, I always enjoy watching him wrestle, and I'm with you. He really just never misses. Um, but you know, they what 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 they needed to do was get the titles off Dalton Castle and the boys. You know, I mean, it's a fun gimmick. You know, there's only so much you can do with it. Uh, like you said, the in ring product with with them is is just kind of there. Um, you know, you've got like three super credible monsters on the other side. I enjoyed the match. You know, there was really nothing not to like about it. I think it, you know, it, it did what it needed to do, which was get the titles on, on the embassy. That's going to be the plan going forward. And, uh, you know, that, 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 that's, it. that's it. It was fine. You know, uh, I think this match was like very important for the pacing of the show, you know, because there were like three like matches in a row 
that were very intense, you know, and this didn't feel intense in that way, you know, and it felt like a pretty good palate cleanser, but not in the, I'm going to go take a bathroom break kind of way in the, okay, I enjoy what I'm watching, but it allows me to kind of settle down and get hyped up for the rest of the show again. Next match up we have for the ROH pure title, uh, for the third match in the third match of this series, we had Willer Yuta versus Daniel Garcia in a pure rules match. Um, this match, they're really good. They have really good chemistry against each other. It's it's like you have almost two guys that are the almost the I would say similar, not the exact same wrestler, but they're very much a mirror of each other. You know what I mean? They they do a lot of the same things. Wrestle very very physical style. So this match is for a person with a particular taste. That happens to be me that likes technical wrestling. And, uh, you know, if you don't like technical wrestling, I can honestly say it probably came off boring to you. I'm going to let you get you give your thoughts on it, Dave. Oh, I don't think there was anything boring about this. You know, when you're watching a Ring of Honor pure match, you know, you're getting a specific kind of wrestling. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm like you I, wrestling. Good wrestling is good wrestling. And it comes in all shapes and sizes, styles, types. Right. So, uh, you know, to me, I really enjoyed this. And, you know, I felt like it was it was sufficiently different from their previous matches because that was kind of my worry was they had an absolute banger of a match at uh, Death Death Before Dishonor. And, uh, you know, this match was not on that level. Right. It wasn't really, you know, given the same time or, or put in the same position to to be that kind of match. But I, I really enjoyed the psychology behind it. You know, I mean, I, I'm not I haven't watched a lot of Ring of Honor pure title matches, but I, I knew of the the rope break rule where they get three in a match, you know, but I hadn't actually seen them use it in in, a, in an actual match before. And I thought that was really interesting how, you know, Daniel Garcia intentionally burnt uh, Wheeler Yuta's um, rope break so that when he finally put him in a submission later on. Wheeler Yuta had no real way out, you know, and they built to that spot. And I thought it was very effective. Um, I liked that, uh, you know, th- this match had a certain intensity to it. You know, it wasn't the catch as catch can back and forth chain wrestling kind of match that they've done in the past. This just felt very intense, you know, and uh, I think that the, that they had a finish that matched that intensity with, you know, Wheeler Yuta elbowing him until he was knocked out cold. And, uh, you know, I really just like, in case, you you know, you, people couldn't tell by now, like creativity of finishes is big in my eyes. You know, I think there's too many matches that are, you know, that end in one of two ways. Either guy A hits his finisher on guy B or guy A rolls up guy B. So I always like matches where the finish is something outside the box. And we certainly got this here. So no complaints on my end. I thought this was a, a rock solid match. We and literally a, a got this. Of the card. We got that three times on this show. So this was your show, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. this was my wheelhouse, man. Yeah, yeah, the elbowing him until he was done. I thought that was great. What I did think is the best part about their three matches is they all felt completely different, and I think that was a theme in the, in this one. I think uh, I think Jericho may have something to do with it because he's always thinking outside the box. That was you know just using the Blackpool Combat Club finish. To finish the match was so great. And for what the third time, we got a new ROH champion. We got a new ROH champion as Will Uta beats Daniel Garcia for the ROH Pure title. The next match, I'm going to let you go first, sir. Because, you know, I probably have lots of words. Uh, The next match is... The real main event, honestly, the real main event of the show. I said it before. I told my friends when I watch it, this is the main event of the show. It was FTR versus the Briscoes in a dog collar match. Uh, um, What was it? Dax was uh, connected to Jay. And Cash was connected to Mark. Is that how it worked? Because yeah, Jay, so. Jay, Jay so. Driller, so he was the former champ. So, yeah, the former ROH champ, Jay, was with Dax. Cash was with Mark. And they had a match. And I'm going to let you talk about the match, sir. Yeah, what a what an absolute masterpiece of violence, you know? I mean, it, we were joking and uh, around before that, like, the over-under on, you know, blood in this match would be, like, three minutes. No, um, I think it was Mark 
was bleeding 37 seconds into the match. I mean, it was just unreal. You know, the level of brutality, the creativity of spots, the the psychology that went into this match. I mean, just unreal, just absolute unreal stuff. Everything that you would expect from two tag teams that aren't afraid to get physical and, you know, pride themselves on the grind and old school wrestling. I mean, this, this gimmick was absolutely perfect for them. I'm not usually a fan of the dog collar gimmick. And this was by far my favorite dog collar match of all time. And uh, I don't think it's cool. It's Macy's Gifts You'll Love to Give sale with great deals for everything on their wish list, like 50% off cozy coats, jackets, and vests for her, perfume and cologne gift sets for $50 and under, and shop specials like 20 to 50% off the season's hottest toys from Bluey, Melissa, and Doug, and more. Plus, everyone gets $10 in Macy's money for every $50 spent, now through Thursday at Macy's. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. This holiday season, Peloton's got a gift for you. Right now, get up to $200 off accessories with the purchase of a Peloton Shred. Accessories like non-slip grip resistance bands, a heart rate monitor, yoga blocks, and more. Take your workout to the next level with Peloton. Motivation that moves you. Hurry, this limited time offer ends December 25th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access memberships separate. Offer ends December 25th. Cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. With the new Chevy Silverado, you might be driving in this. But with the Silverado's redesigned interior and large infotainment screens, it'll feel more like this. Introducing the new 2022 Chevy Silverado. Find new upgrades. Find new roads. Chevrolet. Close, you know. Um, so, you know, it was it was interesting to me. I mean, I, I you know, in the end, I think this was as good or better than any of their uh, than either of their previous two matches i know dave Meltzer agrees with us he tweeted it out right away that he thought it was the best match of the three and uh, a contender for match of the year and uh, i can't disagree i mean i just absolutely enjoyed it start to finish you know i rewatched it again the next day didn't didn't uh didn't like it any less already knowing the outcome you know but man un- unbelievable spots in this match you know from cash tossing um you know, I think you said it was Mark that he was connected to, right? Um, you know, tossing him off the ring apron through through chairs to the to Dax wrapping his head, uh, wrapping the chain around his head, and doing a top rope headbutt to the superplex off the top rope to like the emotional finish of of you know Dax being choked out with the chain while cash tries to come in and save him and is being held back and can't do it. And you see the look of anguish on his face and it, it was perfect. I mean, there was really nothing that could have been done to make this match any better than it was. And uh, I know that you're going to have lots of thoughts on this. So I'm going to turn it right over to you so you can make it happen. All right. So you did say a lot of the things I was going to say, which is great. Honestly, that's fine. Cause I can just actually put the color around the match from being there in person. So, you know, they're coming out and like the crowd's, up they're ready everybody knows this is the main event they come right through and they come right through and you know i'm i i I shout out to my row because i was like hey man i have my ftr stuff i'm like these are my guys do you mind if i get up there i asked you know i asked politely they said come on get up here because you know honestly everybody in my row other than me (laughs) was rooting for the briscoe so they didn't care so uh, you know first thing happens cash gives me a fist bump on the way in he's like yeah thanks for coming out it was it was like weird because it was like this weird situation where he's like they're i don't know if you see them when they come out they're very much in like in the zone they are they're mean mug and they're about to be in the most physical violent match of their career it's is it, you know they're there they're in that moment the briscoes come out and their jackets say um i forgot what their jackets say like they were the baddest or something like that and the ftr has the the dates on it for like from last year to this year and they're both like got this story this this rivalry is coming right and this is like such an amazing moment like i mean we're in it we're we're standing up and then they just start. And if you notice Dax and uh Dax and Dre, they come outside the ring and they're literally right behind us in our section, fighting on the steps. And just like the mode, the momentum, what type of match this was gonna be was set from the very moment. 
you like you get sometimes you'll get in matches where these t- two teams are supposed to hate each other. They're supposed to be violent, but this is a rivalry. They don't hate each other. They just think they're better than the other. And it starts as a fight from the very beginning. The blood is coming out. Uh, like the holy shit moment for me was the cash uh, pulling Mark through the uh, <laughs> to the floor. And I thought there was a table there because I'm on the other side of the ring. I thought there was a table there. I didn't see it until the playback that he just landed on chairs, right? Dude, I, I came out of this match. I came out of this series. Now, the Briscoes were a good ROH tag team. You know, I didn't see them as all-time great. I came out of this rematch series as seeing them as all-time great. As in, like, just wanting to see what they're going to do. They didn't disappoint with anything. The physicality of the match, the bloodiness of the match. This this was a Briscoe's match. I haven't seen FTR in this style of match. But they rose to the occasion. But, you know, the Briscoes honestly took a lot of the biggest bumps. You know what I mean? It was just, like, it was very violent. And it was very um, it was amazing in this match they both made the match they both showed up you know you uh have a bunch of finisher things cash is like putting throwing all the chairs and he's like finish this fucking guy you know and it's like <laughs> and they catch him and it's just like so good and it's just like and in that moment where Dax is like screaming with the chain in his mouth, like reaching out, there's no rope break. So getting to the rope means nothing. He literally, the only way he's going to get out his move, he is completely caught. The only way he's going to get out this move is Cash uh, coming in. And, and literally, Mark's on the outside just basically laying down and pulling on the chain as hard as he can. There was nowhere for Cash to go. Dax, uh, did he ta- he passed out, right? Yeah, he passed out. He passed out. Okay, I didn't think it was a tap out. He passed out. The Briscoes are your new ROH champions. Like, I, I tell you, hats off to these guys. Like, I, you know, in my looking back at it, after I watch it the second time, I have to say, uh, love Cody and Dustin. They were my guys. And this still will rank, they will still rank as the best singles match I ever saw live. But the best tag team match I've ever seen live, the best match I've ever seen live, was FTR and the Briscoes in the dog collar match. I came in with incredibly high expectations. Incredibly high. Like straight, like this is going to be a five star like match. You know, like incredibly high. They manage as far as violence, intensity, and build of the moment. Manage to... St- Still outkick my expectations. And let me tell you, I thought it was a perfect match for me. If you say, hey, you're four and a half, thumbs up. I'm not arguing with you over a half a star. You say you're four, seven, five, thumbs up. I'm not arguing with you over a quarter star. If you're like less than four, I'm probably just not paying attention to your, this ain't wasn't your type of thing. I get it. You know, whatever. Like I said, they're all imaginary. You know, stars is all imaginary and everything, but I, you know, but there's one guy that matters. And when Dave says this was the match of the year, the other Dave, not the Dave I'm talking to on the phone, but he says I'm the only this, Dave that matters, Floyd. <laughs> and when he says it's one of the match of the years right after the match happens, you know, a person that really traditionally doesn't like these type of matches, he, you know, anything with too much blood, he generally doesn't like. And he just thought this was perfectly executed, as I did I. We just happened to agree this time. Uh, this match... Puts me in awe. I am in awe of all four of these men. I am in awe of all four of them. I am not giving FTR the credit over the Briscoes. I'm not giving the Briscoes the credit over FTR. These four black belts in professional wrestling went out there and put on an amazing, epic, perfect performance. I thank them. I thank them for all the swords that they're still feeling the next day or probably a few days from now that we're recording it. I thank them for the effort. I thank them for entertaining us. That's all I can do. Perfect match. Dude, and I want to want to apologize at this moment to Samoa Joe and Juice Robinson the next match. Dude, I think I caught the finish. <laughs> like live, like I went back and watched it, but live Dude, I was tweeting and texting and just talking about the match. And yeah, yeah, uh, I was a bad fan. 
I was a bad fan. I maybe looked up and saw that uh, Samoa Joe, you know, at, I saw the finish or whatever. So, but yeah, I thought this was the perfect match. Hats off to all the gentlemen. So we are moving on to the next said match. And Dave can follow some color for us. Uh, it is the ROH television champion. Samoa Joe versus uh, Rock Hard Bullet Club Juice Robinson. What do you think of this match, sir? You know, it's it's interesting, right? You know, like somebody had to be in this spot, right? Which is like an impossible spot, right? You know, it's it's following FTR versus the Briscoes in one of the best matches ever. Uh, ver- you know, right before the main event, right? And you know, I was really worried that Athena and Mercedes Martinez were going to occupy this spot, and a match that I was really looking forward to was uh, was going to you know get the the silent treatment, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I think all things considered, they did a pretty good job here. You know, I am not a Juice Robinson fan. You know, I, I heard that, you know, when he left NXT and went to NJPW, he was really knocking out of the park. There was a lot of hype that that comes in. But every time I watch him, he just comes off as very underwhelming to me. You know, with with that said, I thought they did a good job here. You know, they didn't completely lose the crowd in the way that I thought they did. You know, I mean, and which I think was especially impressive when you think that not only were they in a bad spot, but the finish was a complete foregone conclusion. Conclusion. At no point was there any realistic possibility that Juice Robinson was going to win. But, you know, the match itself was solid. You know, they, they didn't overstay their welcome. Um, you know, they, they both got their their stuff in. And, uh, you know, in the end, the right guy won, you know, and uh, that's that's really all that I have to say. I don't really have a whole lot to add. I think I was uh, I was decompressing a little bit after the emotional roller coaster of, of the match before. Well, on replay, exciting physical match. I think Juice does bring something to any roster because he's a big old dude, and when he's going, when he's going, he looks very intimidating. So when he does lose it, you know, you beat somebody. They didn't just show up. You actually beat somebody. So that was cool. Uh, that was a cool match. And now we finish with the main event, the Ocho, Chris Jericho. Uh, okay. I did miss something. I I did miss something. We're just gonna go back to it. It was before Garcia and Will or Yuta, and this is my bad. Everybody, it's not perfectly structured. Austin usually handles the hosting. Uh, uh, Top Flight was doing an interview with Lexi Nair. Uh, they get interrupted by Angelo Parker and Matt Menard. They challenge Top Flight to a fight, and then Top Flight didn't back down. Big brawl from the backstage to the front. And uh, uh, basic, uh, then Menard uh, pulled out a purple hat and said after Claudio loses tonight that he would be tagged with uh, Jake Hager and they would be called the hat trick. And I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, this is a fun little segment. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, honestly, I, I started rooting for Jericho because of that. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. You're like, Jericho's got to win. I need to see hat trick. Yes. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, it was a it was a fun little segment, you know. I think uh, I think that you know, top flight's a team that can be used a little bit more than they have been. I know injuries have hit them pretty hard, but uh, you know, if they're healthy, I'm looking forward to seeing you know what they bring to the table, whether that be in AEW or Ring of Honor. Yeah, top flight, and they're super exciting. They're they're very much the future. They wrestle the uh, you know the modern style. They both you know, both have good looks, in very good shape. I mean, they're going to be tag team champions multiple times over, maybe starting with the ROH tag team titles. We will see. But I am uh, like, yeah, this was cool. It gave them a more angry side. We got to see a different side of top flight, not just the flying, jumping style. You got to see their, uh, you know, their aggressive style. So we get to go into the main event, main event time. The Ocho, Chris Jericho. Man, he came and comes out, Chris Jericho, dude. Just think about it. Someone was like, uh, he's only over because of the music. Well, he wrote and sung the music, so does it <laughs> I mean, does that matter at that point? It's his music. He's only over because of him. <laughs> you know, that's what you're basically saying. And then Claudio came out and he he has the exciting music and everybody's into it. And, you know, pro Claudio crowd. When the match started, but before the match, match is like Jericho. You just have to say Jericho is a star of stars. 
It's like everybody comes out. Willow has a big entrance and celebration. The Briscoes get cheered. Athena's over. And you're like, man, the crowd's not going to get louder than that. Then Judas starts. And it, it blows everything out the water. You like, you take the top three pops of the night, and it's like, it doesn't touch sing along with Jericho. You know what I mean? It's just, right. it doesn't. Jericho is a different level than everyone else. And it's like, I know people don't like to hear that, but it's true. He's a different level than everybody else. It's like, he's not a heel or face because no matter if he's heel or face, he still gets the same pop when he comes out. So. I, I don't know. It was just, it was crazy. I'm in awe every time I see Jericho and his reaction and how good at this he is. He is an all time great. And then you're going to have like one of the all time great in ring workers, Claudio Castagnoli. And they put on a really good match. If you like, hey, are they going to put on a Ring of Honor match? They really did. They put on a wrestling match. You know, uh, you know, Claudio tried to shake Jake, uh, Jericho's hand. But, of course, Jericho didn't adhere to the code of conduct. Jerry jumped off the ring, sprinted back to attack Ian at the broadcast booth because he's the one person that Jericho hadn't got. But uh, Claudio cut him off, and, man, Ian and uh, Ian and um, Alexander, what's what's his name? Uh, Caprice Coleman. Caprice, yeah. Uh, Caprice yeah. Coleman. They ran, they ran to it, and they were, like, standing right in front of me. I, I, I'd put Ian at a 4-6-40 right there. <laughs> he he get quite five. He 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 get four six on that forty. He he was out of there, and um yeah. So and then they got into the match, and it's just like you know, they're, they're really good wrestlers. You know, it's, it's I like I wish I had more of a, a, a more of a way to pronounce it, but it's just like these are two guys that have been doing this for twenty plus years. I think Jericho's thirty plus years, and this was kind of a perfect match. You really can't say anything was wrong with it. Do you have any thoughts? Give me some yeah, more you know, to it. so so super interesting, right? You know, I mean, they had a lot to live up to, right? Because you know, like you said, the real main event was was the tag match, right? So you know, going on last after that tag match, right? You know, two matches before, like it was like you know very important for them to do something memorable, and I really think they did. And you know, there's a few things that were just really interesting about this match to me. Um, you know, the first was, and I know we've talked about this before, like stakes are really important, right? You know, and I thought not only like was it you know okay a world title match, but also like the fact that you know like if Claudio lost, like that would pretty much be the end of the Blackpool Combat Club. Like what would be left, right? Wheeler Yuta and then like Daniel Bry- or Brian Danielson, who's like not really even doing a whole lot with the with the group anymore right so you know that felt important but like you know this was just really interesting in the sense of like you know you really didn't know which way this match was going to land because you know um you know with ring of honor kind of going off to do their own thing there were two schools of thought like number one they could really use like jericho as the big star anchoring that that company for a while but number two like if they don't want to really have it on aw tv then, you know, sending Claudio off and keeping Jericho on AEW made made sense, too. And obviously, that's the direction that they went in. You know, so I thought that was interesting. Stakes are important, and it really added to this match. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know, I got a kick out of the crowd, right? You know, um, every time there was, like, any type of counting situation when they got to eight and they screamed Ocho, like, I was cracking up the entire time. I felt like it really added to the match. Um, I thought the commentary was fantastic on this match, you know, and they really sold the story of Jericho's a disgrace to this title. We hate him. We're supposed to be unbiased, but we can't even, we can't do it because he's such a scumbag and Claudio needs to win to rid us of the cancer to, to ring of honor and everything we stand for. That is Chris Jericho. So I thought that was, you know, uh, they, I thought they put in like just an exemplary effort on commentary. And as far as the match goes, it was a really well wrestled match. You know, it kind of felt like, you know, a, like an old school WWE main event where like, you know, uh, everything was being stacked against Claudio and like he was playing like the traditional baby face in peril and he had to overcome the odds to win, you know. And, uh, you know, to me, it wasn't about like what was happening in the ring. It was the pomp and circumstance, the spectacle, the stakes um, and and the uncertainty of the outcome and the future of the company that made this like a really special match, you know. And, uh, I mean, that finish was awesome, right? You know, I love the swing. The fact that he did it while the crowd counted to 30, I thought that was just going to be like an extra special moment. 
um, you know, uh, where like, you know, Claudio will usually do it for, you know, 15 seconds, give or take. Right. So for him to get all the way past 30, I thought like that was just a special moment that was saved for this pay-per-view. But for Jericho to tap out, it like took me by surprise. And I instantly thought like that was the absolute perfect ending to a match for exactly what we talked about earlier, which is like, I love creative finishes, you know, and it doesn't get much more creative than tapping out to an extended version of the, the swing. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of Claudio's, you know, uh, Ricolo bomb, right? Like, I think that's just like a very average finisher, but you know, the swing is beyond impressive and it's the best thing that he does. And, uh, for, for Jericho to tap out like that, you know, was, was such a fitting end to this match, this story and, and the entire feud between the Blackpool Combat Club and the Jericho Appreciation Society. So I thought this was a great way to end the show. You know, I mean, it was, uh, it was exactly what it needed to be. Yes. Uh, the tap. Kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, I didn't even really see it until I knew the match was over. I thought he might have passed out in the move. But somebody's like, did you see him tap? And I was like, no. And then I saw it a bit on the replay because the screen at this arena or like, was just like directly up. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, the screen was directly up, so I couldn't really see a lot of angles. Uh, but, yeah, uh, and he tapped out. I thought it was perfect because if you're watching the match and watching the story that we're told, telling, the story that they were telling is Jericho was doing everything he could to avoid that move. Whenever Claudio got his two legs, Jericho would kick and scramble, and he was like, I can't get put in that move. And then when he finally got put in that move, and he just didn't look like he was ever going to stop, Jericho had no choice but to tap out. A different ending than the first two matches. You know, like the first couple times they wrestled, a completely different ending, which is what you need in a third match, especially in this kind of match. You needed a definitive winner. And in both of the matches, with Yuta with the elbows, Claudio with the swing, you got definitive wins. And that is what you, that's what the final battle stands for. Uh, Claudio celebrates after the match. He has the confetti. He, he uh, has them sing the stars at night or big and bright. Clap, clap, deep in the heart of Texas. Yeah, he had to sing that. And that's how the show ended. And we all went home. Yeah, it was an awesome show. I mean, I, I love this pay-per-view. It was one of my favorite shows of the year. I don't think there was a bad match on the show. Um, and obviously, you know, the high point for me was the tag match, but I just thought it was a great production from beginning to end. You know, I, uh, I often think eight matches in a three hour show can be a lot. It didn't feel like a lot here. It felt like everything was well paced. Everything, you know, got like the right amount of time. And there was never a point where I was like, oh, I really just want this match to end. I was really just emotionally invested from beginning to end. Oh yeah. And that's, that's where I was. That was where I was mentally. I was just really into uh like every match like i said the only match and like i said i felt like a bad fan with samoa joe and juice but i was just so emotionally into the match before i wasn't ready i wasn't mentally prepared for it but everything else got my full attention really great show uh t if there's a tk pay-per-view in this world your boy gotta be there because that man to me again everyone has their own opinions to me always delivers always delivers every show that he does i de he delivers so i i just really enjoyed it third row one of my friends hadn't been to a wrestling show in over a year the other one of my friends we had just went to a raw a few months ago and it was just just whole trying to get him back in the world it was just such a good moment we uh we had a really good time i i really did it was a really good time uh but that was roh final battle uh yeah so, as we move on, we are going to do a preview for AEW Dynamite. Winter is coming live from Garland, Texas. Again, your boy, me, will be in the building. Uh, I have actually had the, uh, the honor to be fortunate enough to make it to every winter is coming. I, when I flew to Jacksonville that first year to watch Kenny versus Moxley, I had no idea, and Sting debuted, had no idea Winter's Coming would then be moving to what I have to call my home location. I live in Oklahoma. AEW has not done a show in Oklahoma 
So, like, I consider Dallas, like, my home location. So, I get to go to my basically third AEW show in a row. Um, yeah, and a winner's coming preview. Uh, so excited for the show. Uh, we're going to go through the rundown. Dave's going to give tell me what he thinks. So, winner's coming preview. Chris Jericho in action is the first one. Who do you think he's going to be in action with? Is this going to be the start of him moving on from the Blackpool Combat Club? Gosh, I really don't know, you know? I feel like that this show is going to need, like, a big angle that shoots them forward, and I feel like this could be the spot, you know? I mean, there's two matches here that are ultimately, like, in-action matches, and, you know, like, on on a five-match show, that's a little odd, right? You know, especially a big show like Winter is Coming, um, where, you know, it makes sense for the House of Black, like, they need to be reestablished. Like, Chris Jericho doesn't need to be reestablished, right? I, I think that the likelihood here is whatever happens is going to lead to his next big feud and storyline, right? So I'm intrigued in that sense. I have absolutely no idea what's who it's going to be, right? And I don't know if the opponent is going to matter v- versus what happens maybe after the match. You know, maybe it's just a guy for him to beat and then somebody comes out to start a new story with him. But, um, you know, to me, um, to me, like, it's, it's interesting really because of the where will it lead as opposed to who is he going to face. Yes, and it's just like, and literally like all the champions in the thing, except I believe Orange Cassidy, like the singles champions are all, you know, heels. So it's like, who is he going to go after? Who's going to piss him off? Maybe he goes after the all-Atlantic title in Orange Cassidy. I have no clue, but we'll see what's going on after, uh, during this segment. Then we're going to have Ruby Soho looking to defend her broken nose from all out versus the person that broke her nose, Mr. Ty Conti Guerrero. Uh, well, who do you, who you got winning this match, sir? Oh, I mean, uh, Ruby Soho's got to win this, right? You know, you don't come back from an injury to lose your first match back, right? You know, and, and like, I don't want to be negative, right? You know, but again, does this match really belong on Winter is Coming? Like, this is not like this super hot feud, right? And, you know, as much as I want to care about Ruby Soho, like, I just don't care about Ruby Soho. You know, she, she, it's just, there's, there's something that that's missing that is in other wrestlers that it just, it just doesn't like, I don't enjoy watching her matches. I don't enjoy watching her promos. There's really nothing that I enjoy about her. And like, this is kind of odd booking too. I get that. Like, you know, they're finishing they're they're building on the, the storyline that they started earlier. But like I said, it's not this like red hot storyline. It kind of felt like they were building Ty Conte up a little bit, right. You know, or Ty Mello up a little bit. Um, and 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 this just feels like she's going to be fodder for Soho here. So like I don't know, this doesn't really do it for me. Uh, it's it's a match on the card, but you know that that's where I stand. Uh, yeah, I of course got Ruby winning. It's like if Ruby loses this match, just announce that she got released from the company afterwards. Right. It's just, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's voter right off the island. The tribe has spoken. Yeah, there's just nowhere to go. She has to win this match. So, I mean, because of course she has to go after Aaron and Jay next, and that can keep her in something for a while. Uh, Ruby is one of those people that I think everybody wants to be a champion and wants to win, but. She would be a moment person. She would get she would get the moment. She would win the world title. Everybody would jump up and cheer and be like, "You deserve it!" Clap, 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 clap. And then five minutes later, it's like, "So who's next?" I completely agree. I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> it's it, 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 I just don't see the value there. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. I think that you know, I think that enough people have been developed in the AEW women's division, and then they've brought in enough people after her that like you know there was a time where maybe she could have filled like a really important role at the top of the women's division but i think that time has passed and i don't really have any real interest in 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 seeing her in that role um you know i just i just don't think she measures up with a lot of the other women that they have in AEW at this point absolutely not if you're trying to get to another level i don't think she's the person that takes your division to the next level i mean i like ruby i, I mean I, I like i really don't have anything bad to say about her but you know to say there's a ceiling yeah it, and it's kind of a low ceiling uh house of black in action now i'm really excited for this uh you know you know a couple months ago house of black was going to a different company blah blah, blah or three months ago at this point and now they're back they're you know revigorated they're attacking everybody 
anybody can get it. I feel like this is, to my personally, I feel like this is a building to them attacking whoever wins the Young Bucks Death Triangle series. That's where I just feel like this is going. That's who they're going to feud with. But, yeah, this match, I think it's just going to be, like, three guys. I think it'll be, like, Fuego, uh, uh, you know, you know, Fuego. Maybe my boy Grillo gets a match in Dean. But it's just going to be three guys to just, you know, accentuate how dominant the uh, – so accentuate how dominant the House of Black is. Yeah, totally agree. You know, this is a squash match, you know, and like unlike the Jericho situation, like I, I get it, right? You know, I get the need, right? You know, you're bringing them back. You know, after the Bucks and Death Triangle, they are going to need fresh contenders, right, for, for whoever comes out of that as, as champions. Um, and, and House of Black is a great opportunity. You know, I think that they served a role previously, but they weren't necessarily taken as legitimate, credible challengers during their, their prior run, right? You know, so um, it's a great stable, great gimmick, three talented guys. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think this is the beginning of – the build towards them being the the next credible challenger to the trios championship. Yeah, I would really like the Kings of the Black Throne, uh, Malachi and Brody. I really would love to see them go in the tag team division. Uh, the claimed, I do definitely think they need some challengers to, to uh, you know, definitely where you see as a threat. That could be it, but we will see where it goes from there. Then we have game four, match four. So now I got to tell you, the first person I saw do the NBA theme on the four uh, seven game series between the tri- uh, death triangle, uh, death triangle, and the elite was Mr. Rich Lotta. That's the first person I saw it, but it seems like you know uh, AEW and the meme police and everybody have like ran with it. Like I like I said, I don't know if they got the idea, but uh. He doesn't seem to probably be bothered by it, and they seem to freaking love it. Even uh, uh, Tony Khan got the trademark or, or got the, the rights usage for the M- old NBA on NBC theme. And tonight there was a little video package with it playing in the back talking about uh, what was coming up on that and talking about Game 4. Will the Elite be able to tie the two, or will the Death Triangle take the commanding 3-1 lead? Uh, I personally think it would be terrible advice to do a 3-1 lead, but what do you think, Dave? Well, so first off, I hate to give credit to Rich Lotta, as I think he's an absolute human piece of garbage. But uh, yeah, he was really ahead of the curve on this, you know, taking the NBA style uh sports preview for this um you know i've enjoyed all those videos uh you know obviously everything i say is in jest he's a very good friend of mine and uh you know the two of us have have gone back and forth on i don't know dozens and dozens of podcasts in the past but uh you know i i'm with you you know i think that uh you know the elite should win right because if if you go up three one and i saw that kenny omega had tweeted something out about how no team at you know about the the clip of you know when when Golden State was up three one on Cleveland in the in the NBA Finals, that like no team had come back from the three to one deficit in the finals, and so he was kind of foreshadowing that maybe the elite will go down three to one. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that you know they they, they square it up here, right? Because if you go three one, then you take away the intrigue of who's going to win in the next two matches. Like this is very clearly going seven, no matter what. So you know if you go three one, then you know everybody knows the elite's winning the next two. And so I, I just don't think they're going to go down that path. I think they want to keep the uncertainty of outcome open. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking forward to this. I mean, you know, I, I like all styles of wrestling. You know, I know a lot of people want to choose like, you know, FTR versus the Bucks, but I like all of it, you know, and I know you do too. And and so I really appreciate what Kenny and the Bucks bring to the table. I love Pentagon and Ray Phoenix, you know, and 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 gosh, I mean, just every every match so far has just been an absolute home run, and I don't expect anything less from from this. But I have the elite winning, tying up the series, and uh, you know, leaving some intrigue as to you know how the next couple matches are going to go. I, I've never seen a Kenny Omega match I didn't like. I've never seen a Young Bucks match I didn't like. I've never seen a Lucha Bros match I didn't like. And since he left the WWE, I've never seen a pack match he I didn't like. So anytime these six people in the ring, put me as close as I can to the front and shut up. 
and just let me watch them do their thing because they're going to find a way to entertain me in a way that I had never been entertained before. Uh, you know, Kenny Omega, the Michael Jordan. He's got like Michael Jordan. And, you know, Matt and Nick are his Scotty and Dennis. And they're going up against the Lucha Bros. And it's, uh, you know, the best one is Carl Malone, John Stockton, Byron Russell, you know. And it was like, the you know, really the only people that, you know, kind of gave a threat to those 90s Bulls. And that's what you got going on here. I, I think eventually the elite are going to win because, you know, the team with Jordan always wins. But it's going to be fun watching it go down. It's like, and tomorrow, like I said, Get my popcorn right before it. I'll run up to the concession to get my popcorn right before and just enjoy the match. And it honestly doesn't matter who wins because we're going to get seven uniquely entertaining matches out of this series. We get game four tomorrow. I am really looking forward to it. I do think the Elite go ahead and win and make it 2 2. I think that the, it, then it becomes the best, kind of a best of three series. And of course, it's ending in LA. So. That's almost unfair, but it is ending in L.A., so I'm looking forward to that. Last but not least, it's time for the main event. We got MJF, the newly crowned AEW World Champion, and his first defense, but he's defending not one, but two things. I personally didn't like adding the diamond, di uh, diamond ring to this. I thought the match was just good enough with the world title but you know you want to up the stakes so you have aw uh mjf defending his three time diamond uh what is it called diamond dozen battle ring whatever uh dynamite diamond ring and his world title against ricky stocks in his first uh world title match i believe and Dave, how do you think this is going to play out? I know who you got, but how do you think Yeah, I mean, look, I'm out? really interested in how the match itself plays out, right? Like, I imagine it's going to be this, like, you know, pretty long, epic back-and-forth match. You know, and MJF ultimately, like, cheats to win, right? You know, I mean, that, 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 that seems to be where they're going to go with this. But, you know, I'm very interested in it, right? Because, you know, MJF, like, the narrative for a while was that he wasn't a great wrestler. Like, he's obviously very good. But he's not like this elite in-ring worker, right? You know, it, he tends to have great matches with the right dance partners. Ricky Starks, you know, he's fantastic on the mic. But I haven't seen a whole lot of evidence that he can, like, you know, really deliver at, a, at, a, at, a, at the level that we would expect, like, you know, to be, like, main event caliber in AEW. You know, that doesn't mean he can. I just haven't seen it yet, you know? And so I'm interested in the match quality. I think that how hot the crowd is going to be is going to play a big factor, right? If you get a super hot crowd like you got, you know, last last week in Texas, then, uh, you know, that goes a long way, right? You know, but if it's like a crowd that is a little burnt out or a crowd that's not as hot, like this match could struggle a little bit, you know, but I'm interested in seeing it. You know, I mean, Ricky Starks clearly has shown that he can be a main event player on the microphone. This is his time to show that he can be a main event player in the ring. And uh, that's what I'm most interested in is like, you know, how good is this match, right? Does he come off like a star in the ring or does he just come off like a star on the microphone? So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me. I mean, there, there isn't a lot of, you know, intrigue as to who's going to win, right? You know, I mean, MJF is winning. He is not losing the title. He just won. So, you know, uh, there, you know but, but I'm, in, I'm interested for, for all the reasons that I mentioned. Yeah, I, I just I want to see them to have that banger. I want to see them have the banger. This match is all going to be about how good the actual entering product is. Can Ricky Starks perform? He, I've seen him perform on that promo on that next level. Can he bring it in a match on that next level? Can it be a match that people are talking about? I, I, I really do think it needs to be the match of the week as far as in everybody's mind. Everybody talks about, I mean, MJF, in a way, you're, you're a heel. You're this, you know million dollar once in a generation heel when you're a really good heel what do you do you make faces look better even in defeat you make them look good are you going to make ricky starks look good are you going to make ricky starks in this match we are going to find out i'm looking forward to it my answer is yes 
I think he does because I just think Ricky is right there and people want to cheer for him. And MJF is just that asshole to make it happen. So I am really rooting for it. But I do. My bar on this match is high. So if I come back next week and say it didn't hit my bar, understand it's my fault because I I pretty much in my mind have set it too high. I'm thinking Ric Flair versus Barry Windham in the 80s or Ric Flair versus Sting where he would just make the guy. Just like sure through sure effort in selling, he would make you love the guy that he was wrestling against. So I'm hoping we get that uh, tomorrow night, and we will see. But I am really excited about for this whole card. And if you know AEW, guess what's going to happen? Uh, yeah, uh, you know they're going to add a match or two tomorrow. So this is the the most up to date preview we can give because they're going to add a match. Uh, I don't know what it'll be, but I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you excited, Dave, for tomorrow? I am excited. You know, I uh, listen. I've I've come to really like. You know, I mean, listen. I, I people who know me know I'm a WWE fan through and through. But uh, I I come to really look forward to Wednesday nights and to sitting down and watching great two hours of wrestling because even when it's not as good as it could possibly be, Dynamite is still a really really good show every week. And you know, even if the card on paper tomorrow is very top heavy, it's still winter is coming. It's one of their bigger non-pay-per-view shows of the year and you know it's going to deliver and you know there's going to be surprises and you know it's going to start angles and and the wrestling is going to be great. And I I am I'm I'm very excited for it. I can't wait to see what happens. Yeah, it's going to be uh it's going to be epic. And then tonight around 6 o'clock so tomorrow, uh, some people might have seen on my Twitter, if you follow me on Twitter, and Dave, my arbitrary number, because he says I have arbitrary goals, I am getting to, tomorrow will be with my 40th live AEW show. Number 4-0, I, it's, you know, big number for me. I'm excited about it, because, you know, I'm kind of 41 years old, so I've 40 shows. It's like, this, uh, in January, they turned four, Right? So, and in their four-year existence, which they didn't even start running shows into May of their first year, I have been to 40 of their live events, and what means a lot to me, none of them have been in my state. So, it's like I have done nothing but travel to see AEW, and I was really excited just about the 40th show, but in the back of my head, I was hoping and I was hoping, and then they announced the meet and greets for tomorrow. FTR is at the meet and greets. My boys, uh, Cash Wheeler and, and Dax Harwood uh, at, as, uh, are part of meet and greets. Then you'll get world champions, uh, a world champion, uh, Jamie Hayter. And then you will get pretty much the face of the firm as far as wrestling, Ethan Page. So I'm really excited about them being at, in the, uh, I'm really excited about them being the meet and greets for tomorrow, and I plan to take a tiny little gift to my boys, Dax and Cash. <laughs> and if you know what that tiny little gift is, it is a big old bottle of Classe, Daz- uh, Classe Azul tequila. Man, when you said tiny little gift, I just instantly assumed something else. But yeah, no, Classe Azul works too. So yeah, man, you know, I just want to comment, like to go to 40 shows in such a short period of time is incredible, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to to join you on on quite a few of these. And you know, these trips are epic every time, right? You know, it never gets old. It never gets boring. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for you. I know that you've been looking forward to your 40th show and that this is a big deal to you, even if I do joke with you and mention that it's a nonsense goal that you just set as an excuse to fuel your addiction. Uh, I am I am happy for you. You know, I know this, this kind of thing makes you happy. And you're in for a great show tomorrow night. I think, uh, I think they're going to tear the roof off the place and you're going to have a blast. Yes, wrestling is my heroin. That's the great thing. Uh, but you know what? It's okay to be addicted to it because I don't steal from my family to uh, <laughs> do my wrestling shows. You don't. You don't turn tricks on the corner. You know. You don't. You don't steal from your family. Like this is a relatively healthy habit compared to you know some of the other options out there. Yeah, I should throw out the word yet. You know, who knows? Life. There's happens. a first time for everything, yeah. Floyd. Life happens, man. There is. Uh, there is a first time for everything. All right. Well, that is it. For our show, Dave, do you have any parting words as your first time on the show? No, I mean, I'm glad that you had me. You know, we've been talking forever about getting me on here, but, you know, obviously my my life schedule is is challenging and it doesn't necessarily work for filming podcasts. But I uh, couldn't have been happier to do this. Can't wait to jump back on again. 
And I uh, can't wait for the show tomorrow night. Yeah, I work a vampire schedule, so it is really hard for us to get along. I'm like, I recorded, made sure I could get recorded early at night. Austin was out of town. Uh, so I was very excited about uh, having you on because you haven't been podcasting in a while. And I just, now get you talking. Get you talking about the old wrestle graps. Well, yeah, we it, de- uh, it's it's uh, it's an addiction, right? Like now that I've done one, now I want to do like thirty again. So uh, you know, maybe this is the the start of me jumping back into the podcasting world. Who knows? Hell yeah, I want you and Rich on the show talking about stuff and arguing because I never got to hear those shows. I know I can probably oh. go download them anywhere. Oh but, yeah, I'm man. sure I'll end up on uh, on One Nation Radio at some point. <laughs> yeah, if, d- uh, if they have the balls to invite me on and, <laughs> and, and have an alternative perspective. But you know, that's another conversation for another day. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, play once they time. once they hit the game, game seven, they need you on for the game seven show. Right. You know, you know I mean, <laughs> if they want a special guest, is there anybody more special than me? No, no. You are special in the way that your mother told you you were. Exactly. That's what I tell myself every day. All right. Well, thank you all for tuning in uh, this week. Uh, Thank Dave for jumping in. Uh, Next week, Austin should be back. So looking forward to him doing the hosting thing because I kind of hate this. Uh, So So for uh, Floyd and Dave, I will leave you as I always leave you, whether it is home, work, or school. Always do your best to be elite. Without the ones like you, who work tirelessly to keep things running, everything would suddenly stop. Hospitals, factories, schools, and power plants, they all depend on you. No matter the weather, emergency, or time of day, you're the ones who get it done. At Granger, we're here for you 24-7, with supplies and solutions for every industry, and access to product specialists ready to help. Call, clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.